Hello, I'm Katie Nichol, and I am an educator at the Ringling Museum. Today, we are going to take a virtual tour of some of our artworks in the museum. On today's tour, we will be looking at four works of art that introduce you to the Ringling. We'll look at ancient Roman sculpture, European painting, Asian sculpture, and a modern photograph. I'm excited to introduce you to the Ringling, but before we dive in, let's talk about what museums are. Museums are places of learning and exploration. Museums tell stories and teach using objects, offering the opportunity to look at something in real life. Although we aren't in the museum right now, digital photographs and scans make it possible to learn from original objects wherever you are. Most of the objects in museum collections are examples of primary source materials, meaning they are originals. An example of a primary source material in written works could be the original Declaration of Independence, written by America's founding father, Thomas Jefferson. You can read the Declaration online, in a book, or even visit the real thing in person. All of these ways of reading the Declaration count as reading a primary source. Secondary source materials are materials that interpret or analyze the primary source materials, such as an article that summarizes the Declaration of Independence. Museum objects are primary source materials because they offer insight from the perspective of the person, culture, or society that created that work of art. Labels and tours like this one are then the secondary source materials because they help to interpret the original work of art. The first work of art we'll be looking at today is actually located outside of the museum walls. Down by Sarasota Bay stands a marble sculpture of a man in armor with his right arm outstretched, as if he is gesturing to command a crowd's attention. Although this sculpture looks very old, it's really a modern copy of a much older original. This copy was made about 100 years ago, but the original was made during the Roman Empire over 2,000 years ago. That means the copy at the Ringling is a secondary source, while the original sculpture from the Roman Empire is the primary source. Before we talk about who this man is and what the sculpture is thought to represent, let's take a moment to look closely at the details in the artwork. As I look, I'm noticing a few things that make me curious and a few things I think I can figure out about the man. The first thing I notice is that the man is wearing armor that reminds me of ancient Rome. He has on a breastplate and a pleated skirt. He's also wearing a long cloak that is draped over his arm and it makes him look regal and important. Despite wearing armor and wearing a large cape, I'm noticing he doesn't appear to be wearing shoes. While we're looking at the lower half of the sculpture, I'm noticing something that makes me curious. There is a naked baby figure near the man's right leg. I think this baby represents Cupid, the god of love. There are a few clues and symbols I'm noticing that let us know this figure is Cupid. For one thing, he is a nude baby with wings. And for another, he is riding on a dolphin, both common symbols associated with Cupid in Roman art. Symbolism was an important tool in Roman art, and the Roman viewers of this sculpture would have been able to interpret its meaning, even if things may seem confusing and complicated to us now. This sculpture is a portrait of Augustus the first emperor of the Roman Empire. Augustus is responsible for the transition from the Roman Republic, which was ruled by senators, to the Roman Empire, ruled by emperors. Before Augustus took power, he was known by the name Octavian. A couple decades before the original sculpture was made, Octavian was battling with Mark Antony and Cleopatra for power in Rome. After Octavian defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra in the naval battle of Actium in 31 BCE, Octavian crowned himself Augustus, emperor of the Roman Empire for life. This was a huge break in tradition from the way Roman government had previously operated. Before Octavian, who is now known as Augustus, took power, senators represented the people in government in the Roman Republic. After Augustus seized power, Emperors ruled Rome and all of its conquered territories. Pause this video now and discuss some other differences between the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. 
This sculpture is a lot like the political propaganda we see today. Made shortly after Augustus was crowned emperor, the sculpture tells the story of Augustus's triumphs, his connection to the gods, and his promises of peace. This political propaganda is perhaps most evident in the breastplate Augustus is wearing. Filled with Roman gods and goddesses, the armor represents Augustus's divine right to rule, a fact that would have been important since many Romans had backed his rival Mark Antony. Also shown on the breastplate are representations of the nations conquered by Augustus, showcasing the peace and the expansion of power that Augustus brought to the empire. Think about modern examples of propaganda. What are some symbols commonly used in American politics today? Pause the video now and discuss with a partner. Caesar Augustus was an important figure in the Roman Empire. He defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra, and by doing so, the Roman Republic officially transitioned to the Roman Empire. As the first emperor of the Roman Empire, Augustus's public perception was extremely important, and sculptures like this one helped solidify Augustus's reputation as a powerful, wise, and divine ruler. Augustus remained one of the most important figures in Roman history due in part to his fame and also because this is an extraordinary work of art. This sculpture has been widely copied. The original Augustus of Prima Porta was rediscovered in 1863 in the Italian town of Prima Porta, a suburb of Rome, and it now stands in the Vatican Museums. The sculpture at the Ringling is a modern copy of that original. In the early 20th century, museums and collectors purchased copies of original works of art so that local students and art lovers would not have to travel far to experience famous works of art in person. Copies like this one made art more accessible in the pre-internet age. Our next work of art looks back at Roman religion from a later culture. Made around 1625 by the French artist Simone Vouet, this painting shows how even long after the Roman Empire ended, Roman culture and mythology continues to inspire artists. There are many complicated interactions taking place in this painting. In the center, we see Venus, the goddess of love, wrapped in a brilliant blue fabric with her arms around Mars, the god of war, seen here as a surly figure in red. Below the couple is a winged Cupid reclining on a green cushion and pushing away a net that has been thrown on top of him by an older winged figure in yellow. Roman mythology is filled with stories of the goddess of love's many affairs, and this painting shows one of those stories. In Roman mythology, Venus was married to Vulcan, the god of fire and metalworking. Vulcan didn't know that Venus was having an affair with Mars, and their affair led to the child Cupid. Determined to embarrass his wife in front of the other gods, Vulcan trapped the couple under a metal net. In this painting, the artist has interpreted the story in a different way, replacing Vulcan from the story with the winged time holding a scape, instead exposing Cupid and not Venus and Mars to the world. Time, or as the Romans knew him, Saturn, was thought to be the final destroyer of love, and Vouet is giving a nod to the ancient Greek philosopher Crates of Thebes, who said, Insatiable desire subdues love, but if not, time will certainly, and if that is not enough, the snare will. What examples do you see in the painting that illustrate that philosophy? Pause the video here to discuss with a partner or write down your answers. Now that we know the story that may have inspired this painting, Let's use the visual elements in the painting to figure out what each figure might be thinking. Pause the video here and write down the four figures in the painting, Venus, Mars, Cupid, and time. Based on each figure's facial expressions, body language, and other symbolism you recognize, what do you think each figure is thinking? When I look at this painting, I see a lot of tension. I think Venus is pleading with Mars to stay, and the way she is using her hands to turn Mars's face towards her makes me think that she is persistent and still very much in love with him. Mars, on the other hand, looks bored and upset with Venus. 
I see him resting his head on his hand and turning back towards Venus in a look of disgust. So I don't think he's very happy with the way the story is turning out. Cupid is a lot more complicated. He's relaxed, leaning back on his left arm, and seems to be gently pushing away the net with his right hand. He's staring time directly in the eye and seems to be saying that this isn't the time, or maybe it's not his problem. Time is the most menacing of all the characters, and his surly frown matches Mars' look of displeasure from the other side of the painting. With his muscles tense, his chin lowered, and his face in the shadows, I think time is angry or impatient. Pause this video now and share your thought bubbles with a partner. The stories of ancient Roman mythology have been passed down through generations, inspiring artists for thousands of years, long after the Roman religion died out. Hinduism is the third largest religion in the world and has been continuously practiced for at least 6,000 years, changing and adapting with the times. While the word Hinduism is a fairly recent term, only coined a few hundred years ago, Hinduism likely has roots in the Indus Valley civilizations. This sculpture dates to around the 13th century and shows the god Shiva Nataraja, Lord of the Dance. Shiva is shown dancing in the center of a circle of flames with his hair flying out like snakes, multiple arms bent and upstretched, and with one leg bent and raised in motion. Before we get into the symbolism of the sculpture, let's talk about the way the artist depicted Shiva. You can pause the video here to discuss your answers with a partner, or you can write them down independently. How can you tell that the figure is dancing? What tools has the artist used to depict movement in the dance? In Hinduism, the gods and goddesses take on many forms and incarnations. Shiva is known as the destroyer, and along with Brahma and Vishnu, is one of the three forms of Hinduism's supreme divinity. Shiva, like the other Hindu deities, takes on many forms and functions. As the lord of the dance, Shiva appears as the cosmic dancer, marking the destruction of one eon and the birth of the next. There are many symbols associated with this destruction and rebirth in the sculpture. Shiva holds objects in two of his hands. To our left, he is holding a sacred drum that he uses to create the world. And to our right, he is holding a burning flame that will destroy the universe. With his two front arms, Shiva crosses one across his chest in an elephant trunk pose and holds the other towards us with an open palm, a gesture that communicates fearlessness. This open palm is a sign of hope and comfort for the viewers, a reminder that even though Shiva is dancing the destruction of the world, a new eon will be born through the dance as well. At Shiva's feet, I'm noticing something that makes me curious. Like Augustus in the first work of art, there appears to be a baby at Shiva's feet, though unlike Augustus, Shiva is balancing on the back of this baby. Since I was curious about this symbol, I decided to look it up. It turns out that the figure isn't a baby at all, but is described as a small demon-like figure that represents humanity's spiritual ignorance. Shiva is subduing or restraining the demon, maintaining the balance between spiritual enlightenment and ignorance. The sculpture demonstrates the circle of life and the circular continuation of life and death and life again. It's also a beautiful expression of movement and dance. Can you pose like Shiva? It's difficult to balance on one leg like this, especially when you assume the elephant trunk pose and cross your left arm across your chest. Shiva's dance helps to tell the story of creation. How might you use dance to convey a story? Speaking of stories, I wonder what this girl's story is. Mexican photographer Manuel Alvarez Bravo took this striking black and white photograph, El Ensueño, The Daydream, in 1931. Bravo photographed life in Mexico City and was interested in capturing lines and edges and celebrating Mexican identity and elevating everyday Mexican life to fine art. 
We don't know who this girl is or what she is thinking about, but Bravo's photography style draws me in and makes me wonder about this young woman. What are some things you notice when you first look at this photograph? You can pause the video here to discuss what you see with a partner. I'm noticing quite a few things about the girl and also about the environment she's in. The first thing I notice is that she is completely still, which gives me such a different feeling than the Shiva sculpture we just looked at. Shiva made me feel energized and uplifted, while this stationary girl feels quiet to me and maybe even a little bit sad or melancholy. I also noticed that the girl seems crossed off to the world. She has one leg crossed in front of the other, one arm crossed over her body, and she's leaning her head on her hand like Mars from the second work of art. It makes me wonder what she's hiding. I'm sure you've noticed a few things about this girl as well. I'm also noticing things about the environment the girl is in. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be anything interesting in the background at all, but the longer I look, the more intrigued I become. One thing that I'm noticing is all of the straight vertical lines. The balcony, the window panes, and the lines implied by the girl's body stretching from left toe to left shoulder make the whole photograph feel like it goes together, lifting everything up. Manuel Alvarez Bravo named this photograph El Ensueño, or the daydream. Why do you suppose he chose that name? What do you think this girl is daydreaming about? You can pause the video here to discuss your answers with a partner. I've noticed that this girl appears to be a young woman, not a child, but not yet an adult. When I was around that age, I daydreamed of all sorts of things, dating for the first time, school problems, a book I've just read, and even made up fantasy worlds that I could get lost in for hours. I'm not sure what's on her mind, but she seems totally absorbed by her own daydreams. She hasn't even noticed Bravo as he snapped this photograph. Photographs like this one remind me of the beauty in our everyday surroundings. Though this is a simple balcony with a girl lost in thought, the striking lines and moody atmosphere transforms this environment into an almost magical scene of memory, where time seems to stand still at the demand of this young woman. As you go through the rest of your week, consider this photograph and look at your surroundings with an artist's eye. How are the lines and edges of buildings and plants interacting with each other? What shapes do the shadows make? How does the environment affect the way you feel? Thank you for joining me on this tour of the Ringling Museum today. We started our tour in ancient Rome, discovering how Roman Emperor Augustus used sculpture as political propaganda to tell his story. We looked back on Rome from 17th century France and learned how Roman myths still capture artists' attention. We learned about Shiva Nataraja and the role the Hindu god plays in the order of the universe. And we discovered a young woman daydreaming in Mexico City and discussed the universal experience of being lost in your own thoughts. What will you discover the next time you visit the Ringling?